Good morning and a very warm welcome to Breakfast with Aero. My name is Farah and I am Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings Engineering London and so to our speaker this morning. Nina was born in a small Dutch town in Holland called Oldenzaal. Her dad was a German architect and built the family house, whilst Nina's mum, who was Dutch, was probably the one who had the most influence on the final design, as she simply would not compromise on what she knew as good design. Nina attended a secondary school which majored in the classics, studying Greek and Latin, learning about the myths and the great thinkers of that time. She loved school and could not choose between the subjects, so ended up studying them all mathematics as well as sculpture and drawing. Even more than school, she loved horse riding, and that's what she did every day. Every weekend, she woke up at dawn and toured the countryside, taking part in competitions. When Nina had to choose her studies, she decided she wanted to be a vet. However, soon realised that the veterinary world would be a bit small and she would miss being part of the wider, critical world. Nina studied architecture and structural engineering, and she truly believes the best design is the most interesting where form and function intersect. So without telling her dad, she signed up at the Technical University of Eindhoven, as she originally did not want to follow in his footsteps. Since graduating, Nina has never looked back. Nina has worked on an array of projects, which include the designs of the roof of the London Aquatic Centre with Zaha Hadid Architects, and she has also worked on Skoltech, a project in Moscow, working with HDM on the design of research facilities. Her other projects include the head office for Sky, which has just achieved practical completion, and she's currently working with Grosvenor on an oversight development at Crossrail at Bond Street. And so, without further ado, I have great pleasure in introducing the utterly charming Nina Tabink. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. It's slightly petrifying, and I hope I'll um, bring something nice to you this morning. Um, so ever since I studied architecture and structural engineering, I've been intrigued about the role of the designer. And exclusivity of design is about how this role has changed over time. I've chosen this thought-provoking title as exclusivity can be explained in many ways and means different things to different people. It can refer to excluding designs which limit themselves to a small audience, or it can refer to exclusivity rights which refers to um, the grants and um, re recognition of creativity of designers. And finally, there's the exclusive elite and chic design that appears on glossy magazines. All of these meanings will flow through my presentation. The timeline that is presented to you are my observations of how exclusivity has changed over time. I will start with looking back to when life was simpler and life could be captured in one single image. I will end with painting a picture of what, how differently we will design in the future. In this global, fast and data-rich world we live in today. It was this simple life that was so brilliantly depicted by Canaletto in his precise cityscapes, <laughs> which capture life within this one single frame. This is his most famous stonemason's yard, and it shows stonemasons cutting stone, shaping them, but also the, the merchants bargaining and the people delivering the goods with the boats, and the women yarning the um, behind their windows. Two centuries ago, our ancestors would have known the precise history of the limited number of things they ate and owned, their origin and their production, as well as the people and tools involved in their making. They were acquainted with the pig, the bread, the loom, the dairy maid, and the stonemason. Life was simple and graspable. This is another painting of Canaletto, and it shows um, Lord Mayor's Day, the Thames on Lord Mayor's Day. And again, in one picture, he manages to capture the whole of the governance of London as, and um, all the merchants. 
It was in this simpler and comprehensible world that the polymath, designers like Michael Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci thrived. They approached the world in a rational way and resolved problems by simply applying logic. More so, they did not limit themselves to one exclusive field. Leonardo excelled as painting, architecture, science and engineering. His detailed sketches shows designs for flying machines, temporary bridges, centralized plans <laughs> for churches, the Vitruvian Man, and so on. Most of these designs were way ahead of his time, and there's only a few that were realized. Looking back, we would all agree that his mind was that the one was the one of a genius. However, I'm convinced that living in a comprehensible world meant that he dis employed his mind in this universal way. And I think I can prove that later on by showing that he was not the only one. There were others in his world, in his time. How different is the world we live in today? I'll show a few images of London that depict this fast, global, and data-rich world. It comes as a scale and complexity and pace that is hardly to grasp for any one ind individual. In some ways, I experienced a similar shift when I moved from a small town in Holland and came to the city of London. Soon I realized I was only going to be able to see this very, very little bit of London. What is the bigger London? And it was this bigger picture that the TV program, Britain from Above, was looking for. They went up in the sky and gave a view of Britain and London as we've never seen it before, from above. London is revealed as a global network of interconnected logistical. Transport links bring millions and millions of people and goods in our city every day from a massive container ship, which we don't see, are on a 24-7 flow from as far as China. It's truly astonishing to see how the range of materials and variety have grown exponentially from Canaletto's London. Then again, with that, our understanding of their making and their origin has diminished almost to the point of completely gone. As we know nothing about these container ships, the gantry cranes, the trucks, the distribution centers involved in the sourcing, making, packaging, and distributing our goods, or what happens to them when we no longer need them and discard them as waste. So for as simple and ordinary as a pencil, the material source could cover the whole globe. This is a geography that shows the material sourced. So the graphite writing core would come from maybe South America. The wood that protects this soft graphite could come from a soft wood made in Sweden. The rubber from Malaysia or Thailand and the steel containing this rubber, the little graphite, comes as far as China. So one pencil, in a way, covers the world. For an object much more complex, like our iPhone, some of the materials in them are the rare materials, and if we're running out of them on the Earth, the geography might extend as far as the moon, because we're already thinking about mining the moon, and it's just when the economics start stacking up that that will be the next step. The next image illustrates the fast pace of change. I first saw this image in a presentation of John Robertson in 2012, and it has stood by me ever since. In yellow are the areas which are part of the conservation area or the listed building. It shows the square mile and all these other buildings in the last 50 years have been replaced. So something as static and permanent as buildings have suddenly become dynamic and respond to the dynamic base of the markets and, well, money, really. It's the image of London, our skyline, which I would say that the base has been driven by money and it's forming what we're looking at today. So we're told we're also living in the information capital. But what does that really mean? At its core is the vast amount of data carried over the internet. All our major cities are connected by fiber optics and we share a huge amount of data information in the form of texts, images, YouTube videos. And we've reached a point for the first time in history where our ability to generate information vastly exceeds our capacity to understand it. 
The stats are absolutely mind-blowing. The more pages on the web than there are stars in our universe. There is around 100 billion books have been uploaded on the web. And American teenage girls send over 4,000 text messages a month, which equates to more than seven every waking hour. And this is only going up. We're at the beginning of this. It's in this global, fast, and data-informed world that problems have become wicked, a term I've borrowed to describe problems that are so difficult to even define clearly. Examples of what I would consider a wicked problem is climate change, which is melting our ice caps, resource depletion, and the access to clean water. I believe that even the genius mind of someone like Leonardo da Vinci would crack his brain while thinking his way out of these problems. So, having set the scene, this is only the scene. <laughs> <laughs> I would like you to take you on a journey through time, showing exclusivity of design, how it has responded to a changing world. Let's begin at the beginning. So who was the first designer? To some of them, it must have been Adam from Adam and Eve. Because Adam was the first one to build a shelter when he was expelled from paradise. And even though the primal hut is still a recognized concept in architectural design today, I would argue that we do not remember Adam for his designer qualities. <laughs> if we don't look at the classics, only a few names come up. And one of them being um, Imhotep in the in the Egyptians. And even though the word architect, which is Argus, which is prime or chief, and uh, tecti, which means cladding or building, which is, so the word architect really means chief builder, um, comes from the Greek. It's not until much later that that word is used. So if we look at the classics, it's only a few names, and Imhotep is one of them. Imhotep was he really was the first one to stack these large stones in diminishing sizes and making what became the most famous memorial of the dead, the pyramid. He did that for his client, Djoser, and um, he was awarded with becoming a god, which is quite a notch above the knighthoods that our... <laughs> <laughs> I'll finish there, yep. We know about Imhotep because he was... Um, he was Two contemporaries made an inscription on um, in the um, in the period, which w made him one of the few that really was named. The other exception is Vitruvius, and it's one of them that is often referred to by my colleague uh, breakfast talkers. And one can see why, because he was just as much writing about architectural planning as he was about engineering and construction methodologies. He didn't see um, a division between the two in his book, The Ten Books on Architecture. Most often quote and I has three makings of three qualities of what he considers as makes a good building. Firmitas, utilitas, and venustas, or what could be translated as commodity, f firmness, and delight, leading to the fundamentals of our Western architecture. After Vitruvius, designers seem to fade in history overshadowed by religious figures in what some may call the Dark Ages. I was recommended Ken Follett's novel, The Pillars of the Earth, by a friend when I first came to London, but I didn't finish it, as I found it simply too horrible. It was all about the struggle of men day on day, and it wasn't about building great things. Um, equally, if you read the story of the construction of the Dome of Florence is just as much about the technical accomplishments as it is about the life lost to the Black Death. The construction lasted about 200 years and it's off and on stopped because simply people <laughs> were not there anymore. So Christianity filled Europe with grand cathedrals and magnificent castles built by these master builders. Yet their designs were exclusively for the rich and famous of that time, which is the church and kings, and their names will remain unknown today. So when all this darkness was going on in Europe, a much brighter and more sophisticated world existed in the Middle East, as we know from movies like Robin Hood. <laughs> this moment shows when Azim hands over his binoculars to Robin Hood, and Robin Hood, who's never seen binoculars before, is 
very scared by the enemy being so close to him. Crusaders may have been equally shocked when they first came across something as civilized and beautiful as the hanging gardens of Babylon. The Zionists were celebrated in this civilization and some of it is still visible today. If you ever have the chance to visit Istanbul, you will see great buildings from someone like Sinan, who, who was responsible for 300 of these mega projects, which is insane, if you think about it. So, that was the Middle East. Back to Europe. Luckily, the Renaissance came, and with that came enlightenment, or the rebirth of um, classical thinking. Bringing back on stage the human individual, the Renaissance is often considered as the birth of Western designers as we know it today. Legend has it that a man called Vasari, who came from a small town of Arezzo in Tuscany, when he came to Florence, he was blown away by the richness and variety of the art and architecture on display. Yet, none of the names were known. In 1550, he published what became the first official record of Italian designers which is called The Life of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, including the names of magnificent people like Botticelli, Michelangelo, Donatello and Raphael. But it was hundreds of people and he described the work they did, where they came from, and it was really the first time that someone knew what the designer was. I will now fast forward to the beginning of the 20th century, when designers were asked to design complete new cities, reimagining society as a whole. A prime example is Ville Contemporain by Le Corbusier, and I love this image. It's Le Corbusier's hand hovering over his plant, similar to Michelangelo's God creating. <laughs> it's the hand of an artist creating a new world. He unveiled his plan at the Expo in Paris in 1925. It was an enormous model, 100 square meters, showed, showing the Swiss architect's vision of a modern city for three million inhabitants. The concept was simple, simply eradicate Paris dense and intricate buildings, leaving only the Notre Dame as a memory of the past. Replacing it with what he thought, a plan with systematic, efficient buildings to improve the standard of living. The centerpiece was a group of 60-story multi-use cru cruciform towers laid out in an orthogonal grid. When post-war reconstruction demanded the rapid building, European governments and contractors found much to like in his idea of fast, repetitive blocks and towers. A similar thing was going on in Germany, where the School of Architects Bauhaus introduced the idea of Gesamtkunstwerk, or translated total work of art, they were designing not only the office buildings, but also the employees' desks, their modes of transport, their homes, tables, and spoons they eat their soup with. Designers were no longer simply co constructing iconic buildings. They were imagining society. Their influence stretched to the whole of human life. And for the first time, designers were designing for ordinary people a house to live in. And even though it was a democratized way, it was still very much um, a top-down approach of this vision of this, what we may call maybe a heroic designer. I'm gonna show you a little bit of an example of an extreme heroic designer. <laughs> Do you know the founder? So Howard Rourke is the main character in um, Ayn Rand's book, novel, of 1943, the Fountainhead, and I was absolutely hooked on this book during my studies. But it's quite extreme. He chooses, um, so he's a modern designer, and he rather struggles than compromising his artistic vision. And the book goes on and on, and in the end, finally, he gets to build his, um, his uncompromised building in exchange for being anonymous. But when he then finds out that some of the design has been changed, which happens, he blows up the building <laughs> because he will not accept any compromise. <laughs> At the time, I was totally hooked and convinced this was, this could be a way to do it. Um, I, of course, recognized this. This was a bit extreme. Um, so, 
This will bring us to the star architects, the present where we live. Design is swell beyond all limits with the emergence of the star architects. And I love this. These celebrity star designers are celebrated not solely for their work, but their opinion and their, their thinking. An elite group of mega famous star designers travel the world and appear on the cover magazines. We want to know where they live, what they eat, what they look like. Well, we can. We see what they look like. They've got this very unique style with a black turtleneck. And <laughs> <laughs> Not too much hair. <laughs> they are asked for iconic designs with the wow effect, or Bilbao effect, after Gary. And Gary even made it to The Simpsons <laughs> with his paper model. So, having taken you on a journey where design is used to design exclusive tombs, cathedrals and castles, yet it was until the arrival of the Renaissance we know the names of these designers. We then looked at modern times where designers planned complete cities for normal people like you and me. Finally, we saw designers rise to celebrity status and their iconic stadiums and stadiums could be seen as modern versions of the cathedrals and castles. I will conclude with showing you an alternative, non-exclusive design, which has been happening alongside the story I just presented to you. And I would argue it's likely to be fueled by this global, multifaceted, and data-rich 21st century we live in today. I'll show you three examples. The first example is the work by Rudofsky. It's called Architecture Without Architects. And he presented it in the MoMA at 1965. And it attempts to break down our narrow concepts of design by introducing the infamiliar world of vernacular design. It's a book full of examples of architecture without architects and engineering without engineers. And he argues that that type of work could rival modern designers in both aesthetic and optimized functionality. It's the slow trial and error process of adaptation to a specific climate that can deliver good design. It's the transfer of knowledge of, of years and years that's simply embedded in these buildings. The second example is the work of Zero Zero Architects. In 2014, I worked with, with this practice to build the Wiki House for the London Design Festival. Wiki House ultimately aims to democratize the design of house building. Generic designs can be downloaded, printed, and built yourself. It's the free access to design which has enabled this form of open democratic design. And this is us on, um, just at the building center. And it was a very empowering moment to know that within three houses you can build something. That's absolutely um, a boost. So it's been, it will give a massive boost. And suddenly we see a future where everyone could become potentially a builder or a designer themselves. Lastly, through my teaching work at the Architects Association, I get a glimpse of what our future designers may look like. They are equipped with all the digital tools and simply turn the vast amount of data around them into meaningful bits of code. Our future designers do not shy away of these wicked problems and propose responsive data-informed designs. Design intelligence is applied in writing code and parameters. Not all of these <laughs> designs are feasible, and some of them look slightly odd. Yet our future designers are only at the start of their careers. And the point is that they are not overwhelmed by the fast data. Rather, they see it as a tool to inform their designs. Is design exclusive in the 21st century? It's not. So I realize on this Tuesday early morning, I've taken you through 3,000 years of history. So if there's one thing I would like you to take away, is that we're only a small chain in this long history of design, and all of us are, in a way, change, responding to this changing world. For that reason, and because my latest project is just off Oxford Street, I will end with this down-to-earth quote from David Green. When it rains in Oxford Street, the buildings are no more important than the rain. Thank you.
So this is when you can ask questions. <laughs> yes, Sebastian, hi. Um, well, this is probably a bit cheeky, but um, did, you said uh, how life was so much simpler before, and yet, um, in a way, when you look at those pictures that you showed us, actually, the picture of London shows the Thames full of boats, tiny boats moving in all different directions, carrying people and goods. Um, and certainly, Western civilization um, around the Mediterranean was quite rich. There was a sort of exchange of people and ideas and, and um, products and so on. Maybe not as rich as today's all coming from China. Was it really quite as simple as we like to think it was? Of course, it's my oversimplified um, wording. But I think the main point I'm trying to make is that we're distanced from it. I think before, people, you know, I, I, I use these examples. Um, we had this advert where um, this mother, she asks her daughter where the milk comes from. And the daughter, like a three, five-year-old, says it comes from the fridge. And I think it's this not being able to see, right? It's not, even though, of course, it was very buzzy and there was lots going on and not everyone would understand <laughs> the full picture of what that London was. But I think it was being able to see where your goods came from, how they were made, where the, the product, you know, you knew the food that you were eating. You knew, you saw, you knew the people that were making your clothes. You knew the people that were making your house. And I think it's that being distanced from the process that has put us in a really different view. Do you know, I think it's part of, part of the process of the, if you like, from then to now, the ability of a, a younger mind to be able to grasp the data, deal with it in a way, even now I'm, I've been doing my job in consultants for 20 years or whatever, and some of the new concepts are quite difficult to get your head around. But because of the fact that the minds aren't kind of littered in some <coughs> senses with where the milk came from, then they're already at a different level than you were 20 years ago. Do you not think that's part of the, the, the ability for new designers to grasp these contract concepts so quickly? Yeah, I think so. No, it's definitely a different mind. And I remember when they said, uh, they, they look at it so different and they pick up different things, where, but maybe not the facts, but just how they get information is, they, yeah, it's really different. And I think it, you're absolutely true. They, don't, they also don't need to know that. Yeah. It's a different world. <laughs> they don't need to know where the cow is, you know. No, it's true. I think it's true. Yes, hi. hi. Um, thanks for your talk. I'm placing our work within a kind of historical context, which <coughs> doesn't happen every day. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about the future, and you're ending with the wiki house. How do you see um, the role of the architect in that? Or should I maybe retrain myself? <laughs> <laughs> it is... It is um, yeah, whenever WikiHouse comes up, there's one of the first is like, so do all engineers and designers disappear? Because if everyone can do... Um, if Alistair Parfum was here, who was one of the founders, he would argue probably the complete opposite. It would be a different role, but it would be um, describing this generic design and understanding how you can design a generic. So it's the design intelligence in, in um, describing the par parameters rather than the end object. Um, or they call it like an orchestring, orchestring architect. So it's more about organizing than defining the final product, if that makes sense. Okay. But it's, it's evolving, right? It's not clear. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry, hi. Do you think there's a, um, a role for permanence in architecture in the future? I mean, uh, some I of the most loved buildings through your wander through the past thousand years, are the ones that stood out as being kind of the oh, iconic yeah. ones, the ones that were so different to what 99.9% .9 of what was being built was doing. And in a future where computers are designing timber houses that perhaps will last 20 years or whatever, what, what is the role of these kind of iconic buildings in that sense of permanence? I totally agree, right? And it's, it, I should have gone to the next slide. But what I'm trying to show is that I think there will always be a role for iconic architecture and always be a role for architecture that pushes the boundaries. And whether it's, um, and I briefly said, the stadiums or the stations that we're designing now. But 
yeah, they'll always be. I, I see them parallel. I don't, I really don't, it's an alternative, and I don't think one will replace the other. Thank you. Fascinating talk. Uh, really open, opening one's mind to design, and in, in I guess in the context of history and the long span of, of humans creating things, uh, which is what I like about these talks because it tends to break us away from our daily lives and the constraints that we all sort of live in with building economics and so on. So um, yeah, really fascinating and, and sort of a you know good thought for the day. Well, I think, I think design is very inclusive in the 21st century uh, in that it's, it's meeting an ever-increasingly complex range of social and economic and political pressures. Um, and I think what was very interesting was the idea that also that in, in modern building it's very difficult to, in a way, learn from your mistakes. Um, I thought it's very interesting in, old, in, 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 in the master builders that it was a very intuitive process and something which was, if something collapsed, they learned from it and rebuilt it. And one of the most difficult challenges I think that we have in that exclusivity is how we pass on that knowledge and how we uh, communicate uh, the lessons learned and uh, all of the experience of putting together modern buildings uh, how we make sure we pass that on through the technology to other people. And I think that's where we need to make sure that architecture remains inclusive. Well, I thought what Nina did was um, an extraordinary gallop through 3,000 years of architectural history and engineering history. And in a sense, to capture so much so quickly was uh, masterful, without any doubt. And I think she has the advantage of having both an architectural and an engineering background and she brought both of those um, different disciplines to bear in, in her analysis. As far as the question of exclusivity is concerned, I think, although I, I said at the, in my question to her, I asked whether life was more simple in the past, and I'm not sure if, if uh, her analysis is correct. I don't think life was that much more simple. I think we all still have a, a richness of experiences. People had a richness of experiences. They interacted with other people. They, there were goods that came from abroad. And uh, for example, China, bone china came from China, just as we're seeing modern products coming by container from China. So there, was, uh, there are some parallels, I think, with the past. What she really is saying, though, is that the speed of our interconnectedness is far greater than um, it could ever have been in the past, thanks to the internet and all sorts of mobile technologies. And so I think the big question is, what do we do in the built environment to respond to that richness, that speed of experience? I, I think the jury's out, and I think what she did was to stimulate us all to think harder about where these new technologies are really taking us. I, I think in that sense, it was a very challenging talk and a very welcome talk. <laughs>